2016 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council, and we're going to have a workshop concerning uh, Hagen's Parkway today, and I'm going to ask the town manager to introduce the matter. Certainly. Uh, there's a matter on your, your agenda that we can get to, and hopefully time will allow during the workshop to get into some of that if, if you wish. But I thought it would be advantageous to have a workshop because to introduce it uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, this council has been fairly clear to staff that and we totally agree that Pikes Parkway really needs kind of a, a new, new, uh, a new life into the area. And in mm -hmm. fact, uh, late June, as I recall, there was a meeting of uh, several, of four, three or four of folks around this table, but the Long Range Planning, Planning Board, and SEDCO Board all met at the Town and Country Federal Credit Union and really had kind of a kickoff conversation around a number of things, including some preliminary ideas of, of how to kind of restart or reboot the Hikers Parkway, and a number of those things are in motion. Um, in the subsequent weeks or months, there's been some other development interest and activity that's kind of come to us, and uh, you may recall that over the course of the last four or five months, you've uh, considered some different multifamily changes in other districts, uh, the T&D first, and then some of the TVC zones, and the VR2 and 4 zones. And so kind of in keeping with that, what we're bringing forward and on your agenda tonight is really what we'll characterize as kind of a housekeeping. It's, it's, it's exactly the same sort of philosophy, but it considers uh, those sorts of uses in the HP zone. They are allowed now, but for the same reasons that we've changed the other zones, there's some limitations. Um, so we didn't want to jump right into the specifics of that particular Hygis Parkway zone change without providing some context to of where we're going with the overall zone, uh, really anticipating the obvious question, why are we advancing this and not the other things at this point? So with that, Karen's put together a couple of slides just to guide some of the conversation and then we'd love to use the balance of the time to answer your questions. So if that's Thank you. permissible. Great. Yeah. Um, thank you guys for uh, being willing to talk about Haggis Parkway and the development trends within the town and where we think um, Haggis is really fitting in. So as Tom said, you know, the first thing we always want to look at is, um, you know, really, where's the market? And, and we really did take a look at uh, the market in 2016, and we've also looked at uh, the market, I think, a, a couple of previous years when we've been trying to make sure that Highgate Parkway is really meeting market demand. Um, and so we wanted to just step, step back for a second and talk about um, really what's trending in the market, what we see out there in terms of the types of of companies that are coming to talk with us. And this is town-wide, really region-wide in some respects uh, for some of this. You know, we've been talking about this for several um, months, probably a year, that, you know, the industrial supply um, within the region and certainly within Scarborough is low. Um, there are a couple of things that I think are affecting my assessment of how low they really are, uh, depending on who you talk to, it's a crisis. But what I've seen in the last um, few months are a couple of, of different things. One, we've had a couple of new projects come through that really are catering to the small manufacturer. Um, so we've got two of those coming online, um, you know, within the year um, that will, I think, you know, solve at least some immediate need. Um, I also think that as we go through, we've talked about this at SEDCO and uh, with the Long Beach Planning Committee, that there may actually be some real underutilized space in the various industrial um, sectors, certainly in the industrial park. If you drive through, we often see pretty empty parking lots. And so you've got to think, well, where is that? is that? Is that something that's about to come on the market? Um, is there space there that with a little prompting um, they might be interested in renting out? Um, so that's really what SEDCO staff is in the process of doing, is really going door to door. We're going to start assessing how much space is really in. We're going to start with the Scarborough Industrial Park first. Um, we're going to leave Pleasant Tool alone for right now. We want to um, really talk about um, the Industrial Park and get a sense of really what's happening out there. Because there, ha there are a couple of spaces that I think have been really empty for a long time. I think there may be some that had longer leases since somebody left, and so there isn't that, you know, emphasis to get it back on the market, but that's really what we're trying to, to assess. Um, again, we talked about a couple of new rentals coming on, and we did um, rezone a few years ago the light industrial area that really just hasn't 
played uh, in the market yet. There's really not a lot of property for sale there. So I think that's, that it's, it's not quite right yet to meet um, existing need. When we talk about the office landscape, certainly office is what we think of when we're talking about um, HIGAS in particular. The things that we're finding um, are true in, um, you know, in the region as well as the Northeast, as well as the, the country as, as a whole, is that there's a lot of emphasis on redesigning offices mm -hmm. for better efficiency as opposed mm -hmm. to building new. Some of the things factoring into that are certainly a lack of, um, you know, there's just not enough construction workers right now, and the cost of doing construction is pretty high. So the few projects that are, are that are out there have been coming in over budget, and you know the timelines keep spreading out. There's just not enough people um, in the construction field for a variety <laughs> of reasons. But we're also finding that the office really wants more flexible space. They don't want traditional office. Part of that is related to um, you know lower square footage per employee. There's more mobile workers. People are working at desks like this rather than having their own um, spots. So there's really a lot going on that's changing the dynamics of the office market. Whereas 10 years ago, you might be looking at 400 square feet per employee. Now with uh, new concepts, you know, I've heard as low as a, you know, 75 to 100 square mm -hmm. feet. That is, that happens when you do have mobile workers who aren't, who aren't coming in every day. So there's some shared space going on there. Um, so that's really affecting the ability to build and really what people want. Um, and again, the existing supply that's on the market in Scarborough has really loosened up a little bit. We've got, um, you know, we've got a couple of uh, larger spaces that we really haven't had before. There's 9,000 square feet over, um, you know, in the Roundwood development. Um, there's actually a little bit more than that. Um, that's been on the market for a while. Uh, rental market for lease, not for sale. Um, there's also, you know, the, the space that's getting built across the street. So we've got 4,000 square feet of office that's going to come online as soon as um, Bessie Square finishes. Above the restaurant is where that 4,000 is going to be. And she also has, Cindy also has the vacant space um, in the existing building. Um, so there really is as much as 8,000 square feet right there. And, uh, you know, there's some other office buildings that never got built that were permitted. So there really is some real flexibility at this point, meeting some immediate needs. The other thing that's coming online is this, this race for multifamily. Um, we've been getting a lot of interest in multifamily, you know, not just in Haidas, but throughout the entire, um, I think every, every town in Cumberland and New York County is probably facing this issue about uh, multifamily, it's just the apartment supply in the traditional areas like Portland and South Portland, the vacancy rates are so low at this point that there's no supply out there. Um, there was a, a demand study that was done uh, that really talked about the need for as much as 6,000 new units needed between now and 2018. Some of that is single family, some of it is specifically multifamily, um, but there really is a, a lot of demand. The other thing that I think about with respect to multifamily is, you know, I think that having some diver diversity in our housing choice may really put us in a better situation for attracting um, new office and new professional uh, development <coughs> buildings simply because, um, you know, people want to be closer to where they work, uh, people are concerned about workforce. Um, so I think it really does play into, um, you know, the economic development picture. Next, we really wanted to talk about um, wh what we've done in HIGAS. We've done a lot <coughs> of work. I should say you guys have done a lot of work with respect to HIGAS. So in 2012, we really did add a lot of flexibility in this zone. We added medical office. We added you know, the R&D, the high technology, we added educational uses, we added health clubs, um, places of assembly, we've added some, we wanted to give people flexibility and had some small scale energy facilities, um, elderly and nursing homes were added, and multifamily was added in 2012. Now the, the caveat to the multifamily is that Haigas was always considered to be, and still is, 
you know, a primarily a, a commercial development area. So they did put this 60-40 split in. So the current ordinance says, you know, if you're going to have a mixed-use project, 60% should be commercial, 40% um, can be uh, residential. You know, also in 2012, we did a little bit of streamlining the process. We, we added the performance standards to make it easier to do some of those other uses to add some flexibility. Um, we did add the, the ability to do the plan development review process, and we removed sort of an archaic um, economic development overlay zone. Um, there were some switches to the boundary in 2012. The area that is um, between Payne Road and the uh, Turnpike exit, that actually got moved from Highgate Parkway Zone um, to B2, and that was in order to allow to concentrate more commercial there. And the gas stations and the service stations were allowed <coughs> to be there. And then in 2015, you know, we added the food and the small batch processing. So again, we've tried very hard to keep up with the market and to allow some of these additional uses. So we wanted to look, what's, what do we think we should do in the short term? Uh, one, just because we, we did take a look and say, I think we're pretty good with the market. That doesn't mean there's not going to be some use that comes up that we're going to need to rethink maybe some standards in there. But again, we've tried very hard to keep up with the market. What I think has happened is that people may not know that we've made some of these changes. We don't, we haven't done a full campaign that's really rebranding Haigas as not necessarily that campus style development, but you can do other things here. And that's one of the things that we're working on for this year. We don't think we need to wait. We don't have to think anymore about it. We just need to do, we need to retell the story of Haigas. Um, we also talked about um, really thinking about some um, incentives that are along the lines of the streamlined review. Um, Dan Bacon has um, really looked at this in some detail and felt like he may be able to come up with um, really a staff review process for building on HIGAS. And um, doesn't mean nothing would go to the planning board, but it means a lot of the uh, development review could be done at an administrative level and that could fast track certain types of projects. And we think in the building community, that's a pretty good incentive if you can fast track. Um, and then again, we wanted to come back to the multifamily. Um, the amendment that we're going to talk about tonight at the council meeting, as Tom said, really a housekeeping um, issue to keep it consistent with the other zones, um, to remove that, uh, the, density, the, the density limitation on the per building. Um, so again, we're really thinking of that as making it consistent with the other zones. And again, we already allowed multifamily to happen there. Um, and just another reiteration, there's a lot of interest in multifamily. Um, but these are the things that are short term. We don't have to, we're not waiting for any big study or anything like that. We're ready to go on looking at these things. Um, but we don't want to ignore the fact that, you know, the comprehensive plan is getting ready mm -hmm. to kick off. And it certainly is time to look at Haggis in comparison to all of our other commercial zones. But again, what we don't want to do is say, oh, the comp plan is coming up, so we shouldn't do anything else until that is done. Because we don't really think there's going to be a great deal of tinkering. Um, there may be some on the edges to, to um, you know, as we think through <coughs> other objectives, longer term objectives. But we think we're ready to go right now with some of the issues of the rebranding um, and um, really talk about administrative reviews and some other incentives. And I think that's just a quick overview of where we are, and I think what we wanted to do is check in and see where everyone on the council is. Yeah, uh, on the specific amendment before you this evening, it's fairly straightforward. It's really in keeping with exactly what we've done in five or six other zones. Uh, there are some nuances. The, the HP zone is predominantly commercial, whereas the other ones are predominantly residential. So. Uh, we're suggesting a slightly larger footprint, 12,500 as opposed to 7,500 and 10,000 in other cases. We think those buildings can, that size can be tolerated given uh, the other development potential uh, allowed elsewhere in the HB zone. Um, but we're not suggesting any, uh, we are suggesting a, a slight change in the height to 45 feet uh, <coughs> or three stories, which is consistent with what we've done in the other zones. 
but we're not at this point suggesting any changes to that 60-40 split. Mm -hmm. And I flag that because uh, we have one, I'll say, very viable multifamily project that's uh, actually been reported in the press locally uh, that can meet that standard. So that's not uh, a, a, bar, a barrier to that project because of the uniqueness of it. Um, it may well be a challenge for uh, a multifamily project on a vacant piece of ground because of the challenges of building commercial. So again, I just want to flag what's before you is fairly narrow, fairly simple in, in its essence. Um, but going down the road, there may be some challenges, particularly on that ratio. Could you, Please. Could you uh, might be because I walked in late, I apologize, but could you explain the 60-40 split? Sure, it's, it's intended to um, say it, uh, Haggis Parkway was, all, was meant to be primarily a commercial zone. So we wanted to add multifamily, but multifamily is done um, in the context of a mixed-use, either a mixed-use building or a mixed-use project. And so the project itself should be 60% floor area, the, the space, um, in commercial, and the other 40% can be in um, residential. Gotcha. So it's on a per project basis, it's not an overall Correct. Rate, right? Correct. 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 Per project. Yeah. Thank you. I, I recall the discussion in the politics at the time that there was great sensitivity to kind of really rebounding totally the other way, that we really want to keep, at the time, the council wanted to keep that commercial aspect being the predominant piece to the development. Um, as you were speaking, I have, I have a couple of things that came to mind that people, I think I know the answers to, but people may want to hear the answers to, and one is, why hasn't Haggis Parkway developed? I mean, we keep making changes and tweaking and it's still sitting over there, that's one. Mm -hmm. um, secondly is, um, I know there are some people sitting out there rearing, oh my gosh, we're going to build multi-families. I know there's been a lot of going on in Westbrook uh, over the project uh, off of Spring Street. Um, and um, I, 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 this is my own thing, impact fees. Uh, for schools and are they per unit or are they per building? And then, uh, what was that? Um, those are the two that actually okay. came to. I'm going to dive right into that first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please do. Because it's always like, hey, what's going on over here? Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure there are folks in the audience who can, you know, there's, uh, can, can speak to this as well. So. You know, we've always said Haggis is, is an area for large-scale development and commercial development. But it's not the easiest land to develop. In other words, mm -hmm. you know, there are wetlands, there's separation between the, um, the properties. It's not that it's not good land, it's just that it's, it's not like a traditional industrial park or whatever. So there are some, there are some limitations in terms of the, um, the land that, that's along Haggis Parkway. There's also, um, you know, the, the issue that our vision originally of campus-style development really isn't getting built much um, these days really anywhere. I'm not saying that it couldn't happen. There are a couple of big players out there that, believe me, we've been in touch with, um, you know, who are... Um, they don't take our calls anymore. <laughs> we've been in touch with <laughs> Please don't you want to talk to us anymore? Um, so you know there are a couple of there are a couple of big players, um, <coughs> but the timelines too you know have changed in terms of how long people are taking to make decisions. And I think one of the things that we thought, or certainly I thought, is there is all of this discussion of yeah, all right, we hit the recession and we understood that um, that that there wasn't going to be a lot of development happening during the recession. And then as we came out of the recession and people, it's, the economy is getting healthier and healthier, we kept thinking, well, there's this pent-up demand. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, our assessment, there's a lot of um, um, money in right now in some of the uh, larger firms, but they haven't necessarily moved forward to building new buildings. And there's also been a <coughs> glut until really re the last year or so um, throughout the region of existing office space. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that we are at that, you know, um, crest where a lot of the inventory has been used up. The economy is sound, if not robust, and 
um, there may be some more development happening. I think the other thing that we've come across is the development that did happen, they wanted to be in Oak Hill, uh, the traditional office development. Mm -hmm. They wanted the amenities, they wanted the walkability, um, you know, the, that closeness to other things. And that's really what we're hearing from the office community. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big is issue. Is the uh, multifamily sort of the carrot because there is a high demand for it? But in a 60-40 right. world, uh, it forces the developer to introduce element of co uh, commercial that might not otherwise come. That is a that's a very good question, and we've certainly talked with some people who are concerned about the 60-40 split. Um, so it may need to be flipped or a different ratio to really reflect what the market will bear. Did you talk about the impact? Because it also means that <laughs> multifamily works better uh, uh, and is more compatible in a commercial setting if you're going to have places for it right. than in a single-family residential setting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So other, like other questions? Just want to the impact fee. Right. Yeah. yeah. But that's not people, I'm right. sure it's the school impact fee ordinance uh, applies per unit, so okay. it would apply in this case. Um, and there's actually some pretty good evidence, uh, given the existing multifamily developments, as to how many children, it really depends how many bedrooms they're building, uh, is largely determined sure. on how many kids are created or other right. impacts. And I have my own opinions about yep. uh, the parkway, but I'll, I'll save those for another time. Yeah, and Peter, and Chuck. Yeah, and I guess my question is kind of just building off Jim Maria a little bit. But, but have we looked at where the de I mean, is this a demand issue? Because I actually, look, you know, I mean, when we think about office space, but if you look at what's been happening with microbrews around right. Portland, oh, I mean, no. they have there's a new place. Vegos just announced a huge new yep. production facility. They're just exploding. Right. And it would seem to me that would be a great place for them. So have we targeted the right thing? But more importantly, as as we talk about who we want the target to be, and maybe we need to shift from office space to something else. Mm -hmm. But the other question that I had is, what's best for the town? I mean, when we look at that land, is it better to have sort of industrial buildings that have salaries and incomes and people here and jobs, mm -hmm. or is it better to have multifamily because we get the tech? Which is, which is the best, healthiest place for the town to be? And I think that's, I'd be really, I mean, it seems like it's prime real estate and just wondering. I have a changing opinion on that. I, I have to say that um, simply listening to both um, what's happening in suburban Boston and what we've been hearing from um, you know developers here, and what I know from the, the business community, um, labor is the key to what's going on in this region. There's simply not enough of it. Some of it is you know you, it, and, and part of that, not all of it, but a part of that is definitely the housing community. Um, you know, we're, we're big on trying to recruit people to come to this region and then we get them here and there's, you know, it can take them six months to find an apartment. Um, so I think that the multifamily development is, is very much a part of the economic development strategy and picture. You know, whether or not it belongs in the Highgate Parkway in some, fashion, that's in some respects up to you, but as a community as a whole, I think multifamily um, does uh, increase our ability to have a, a good workforce here, to have employees available for, um, you know, for our, our, our employers. And I think it's a, you know, there's a higher, uh, there's more people in more diverse Incomes that need the multifamily at this point. You've got uh, folks who are not willing, not, and Jim Marie could probably talk to this better than I can. There are people who, who really don't want to buy at this point. Right. Um, you know, so there's, there's that. But, but, but I guess my question is, and that, you know, maybe at a later date. Sure. But it would, and I hear that about it, it gets the labor here. Right. So that we have the real, but for the town, it's sort of our cash flow and some of the things we're facing. Right. Does the industrial applications where we get the property values plus you have activities of people maybe coming in from outside of Scarborough to spend money at Scarborough businesses, mm -hmm. what is healthier for us? And, and, we're, and, and I'd just be curious sure. from a later date, right. I, I understand about the workforce, right. Right. But, but we need to diversify sort of our revenue base uh, and, and what gives us the biggest lift and I'd, I'd just be curious sure. about I know, it's, a, it's in some respects it's a, 
you know, for the future, it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg. You need you need both to happen, mm -hmm. and you know we're looking for that for that balance. Mm -hmm. I will say that um, you know the industrial, um, in terms of you know office rents or, or rents, they're about um, half the price of an office development. So um, you know mm -hmm. industrial probably rents at what five or seven bucks, but the valuation is the key for us. And I guess I. I didn't mean industrial, I just meant commercial sure. versus multifamily. Right. Business right. versus multifamily. But that's been the challenge is that the market doesn't seem to be, it's not there for commercial or office. But, but, so but I guess my question is, it, it, it seems to be there in other places. I mean, I just, you go back to the, the, the microbrews. Right. They're expanding. But the that's why expanding. we did that. Exactly. That's yeah, yeah, but. So, so there is some market. A place matters to those kinds of uses, yeah. right? Yeah. It's matters hugely, and that's one of the challenges with the Parkway. It is kind of no man's land, and it's been a bit stigmatized for all the reasons Karen mentioned, um, and I think that's why we need to breathe some new life into it to kind of reboot it, as, as right. it says. Right. Um, but it is why it, it is why we wanted specifically, we knew that, that this is a hot industry, and not just breweries, but food production mm -hmm. in general, and it's why we did the amendment, yeah. and it's why we're, you know, we're working with some other groups we've, we've you know, we've actually identified a good 200 firms that are either breweries or in food production that are in just the six really urban communities mm -hmm. that are just waiting to expand. Um, and so that's one of the things that we need to get before those, and I agree with you, you know, that's a great market for us. And I, I think we can make I think we can make the case for that. Well, the reason we've been so protective, I guess it's obvious, but it's the heart of our community. It's the geographic center of our community, a gateway in many mm -hmm. respects. And I think had the decision been made to develop uh, conventional uh, industrial, it probably would be built out. Certainly if we allowed distribution and warehousing, it would be built out. But that would mm -hmm. um, really change forever the heart of our community and not produce the kind of rateables that are attractive, frankly, and job creation. Uh, that's a lot of square footage, but it's not valuable, and not a lot of people work in it. Hi. John? Yeah, um, there's a lot been said and a lot been uh, kind of uh, um, talked about in the sense that uh, drives creativity in the conversation, so I think it's really great. Um, so, you know, full disclosure, <laughs> I'm in the banking world, so I finance those breweries, and I <laughs> finance those little businesses, and um, Karen is absolutely correct. A brewery does not want to build a brewery in the middle of um, a wetland in which there is nothing around it to draw right. people in. They want some type of aesthetic value in which people will come and sit out on a patio. Um, even if it's a little bit of traffic that goes by the front, um, at least it's something. So uh, there's some challenges there. You know, just historically, um, since I've been here since the start of the Haggis Parkway, I mean, we, we've been talking about um, both the potential and um, what some might perceive as mistakes that we've made around Haggis Parkway for the last 20 years. You know, I, I remember the, um, I don't want to call them fights, but the debates around <laughs> when People's Heritage Bank, which is now TD, wanted to put their big facility there, and um, at the time it just wasn't the right timing. I won't get into the nuances, and then there's been so many other things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this is the time in which we, um, not, yeah, I'm excited about Sedco's focus on this particular project and I had asked about this when I was the liaison because whatever we can do as a council to support you and support Sedco, I hope that we do that even if it includes monetary support um, because it's um, important that we do that now based on the economic cycle that we are in no matter how you view that because it will take us out the longer time. The, two, the three things that I wanted to kind of bring up was first, um, the challenge, I think, that um, still um, presses that particular project or that particular area is infrastructure costs as it relates to the original assessment fees as well as the sewer and the utilities, which goes into the whole issue around construction. So the question I have is whether or not the town can designate that particular zone as a specialized TIF zone um, to maybe uh, provide an economic incentive for more businesses to come in. I don't know if that's ever been done. Uh, you know, a zone, it's usually done by contract and by individual project, but maybe what we do is instead of doing it on a per project basis, is look at it from a zone that's basis. to do it prospectively without... Right. Because um, that might be the incentive. The second piece is that what, I, at least I'm seeing in my, my particular world, is really, um, it's not just about the big boxes, because that's an easy sell in the sense of getting the biggest uh, project in the biggest space and the use of the most land as possible so that, you know, the, the development is looking at more of an incubator 
um, kind of like those small, um, what do they call that, like those small business, con I call them condos. The, like, sure. You know what I'm like talking the, about? Yeah. They're like on the industrial part on that road, I think it's called, Link is it Lincoln Ave, Washington yeah. Ave? Mm -hmm. yeah, so you know, we okay. have those, they look like little garages, yeah. but a lot of small businesses yeah. are using those as an incubator to get started to then move into something. So, you know, whether or not that's where we focus as well so that we get a developer to go in there and at least do a string of those kind of small projects and have some type of incentive. And one thing that I always wanted to see, um, my last comment, um, Scarborough move into at the right time is really um, a similar model that um, Saco Bitterfit has, which is their, their Seiko, um, or I don't know what their abbreviation is, um, actually offers um, loan guarantees and loan incentives to the small businesses. Um, They're called microloans, um, in which they have a program to support, um, whether it's an upgrade to technology or whether it's a startup cost that you know, banks might need um, in addition to FAME and SBA and whatever the other agencies are, you know, getting us to that stage so that we can truly support. Sure. The last comment, I promise. <laughs> I agree with Tom. I think that, you know, Charles Colgan, the former state economist, said about two years ago now, he said the only way that the local economy is going to change and grow with the demand is if we change the black box that we've kind of created around ourselves over the last decade. And whether the 60-40 split should be changed to 40-60 should seriously be looked at um, because that is where the demand is, um, but there can be a balance. It just might be opposite of what we initially thought because that's something we looked at, I think it was 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, there'll be some, if multifamily is the focus, there'll certainly be some spin-off supportive type commercial uses, whether it's a coffee shop or a brewery. You know, if people are there, other things will happen. <coughs> right. There's demand. So. Uh, it's, it's an interesting conversation, and I, I really think we're at the point that we need to be sensitive to where the market's going and see some opportunities. Well, well mine was really a follow-on on the on the split. Uh, I was just curious, two things. One, you may mention the projects earlier that potentially would move ahead. Would that be the case where we to make that split, or was that looking for 100%? And then the other question was Enterprise about... Enterprise Park. Yeah, Enterprise Business Park is looking at developing their third and fourth phases uh, in a multifamily fashion. So that 60-40 works because they're already built out. They already mm -hmm. kind of meet that standard. So, but that's not per project. That's so that's including the whole park. The whole, the whole park. Yeah, right. it's one park. Yeah. I see. But I think it could be very problematic for a brand new project right. on vacant vacant ground. Got it. And then the other question was like, what what are the mechanics of having that split happen? Like that goes to a committee. I'm assuming to investigate. Well, that's no, part it's of the same ordinance. Yeah. Same it's, it's, same it's just not part changing of changing it. Changing. Yeah. yeah. At this point, it's not. It's not part of the two simple amendments that we bring forward. <coughs> I just flag it as a potential issue going forward. Got it, but it would go through like long range planning. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and the ordinance planning and board. Yeah. Yeah. It could. We felt comfortable yeah. advancing these on a staff basis just because they're so in lockstep with what you've done. I think if we're getting into that ratio, we'd like to broaden that conversation to <coughs> other. Sure. Thank Chris. you. Chris. So um, it strikes me that I mean, obviously we have some development in town. We've got some pretty decent development in town. Um, what are you hearing from people? Obviously, when you go in and someone says, "Hey, I want to move to Scarborough," we're pitching Haggis, we're pitching Oak Hill, we're pitching just get them in town. Then look at what our options are. What are you hearing from people when you yeah. say, "Look, we've got this great project here at Haggis." What's the feedback you're getting? It says, "No, we'd rather have Oak Hill. We'd rather be somewhere else." Um, because it sounds like we're we're trying to guess kind of what things are going on and and it continues to sit there undeveloped while development happens throughout right. the rest of town. Right, right. Um, well, I think we're running into just some of the things that we've, we've talked about in terms of desires. Mm -hmm. And the desire, even for um, some of the larger scale projects that we pitched that, in our minds, we would have liked to have seen on Haigas, have been interested in Oak Hill. Mm -hmm. um, Take Town and Country Federal Credit Union. They could have very easily been out there, probably easier and cheaper, Sure, but they made a conscious mm -hmm. decision. They wanted to be where things were, mm -hmm. so their so employees could get services and walk to the grocery store. And yeah, and that's clear, so, but, but that's never going to change for Haggis unless we develop all the way up around it and, and get to that point. So I guess my question is, is do we hold on and we wait for that, that magic development to happen around it and then it becomes a very desirable area, or do we look at um, something, mm -hmm. you know, a, a smaller development area first and try and, and split it up held, or something? We've held the belief that what comes first is really going to dictate what follows, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we'd love to have the first project really be the, the standard bearer. Um, it may well be that if the, if the people are there, the other uses will follow. I, I don't have the crystal ball. I don't have those answers. But that's where the hot market is right now, and that's where people are knocking on the door. Yeah. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I'm just wondering, look, we've been doing this for, to Sean's point, 10 years now, or I guess. 20. 20. 20. 20. Right. So, yeah. so, you know, at what point do we decide collectively that, you know, maybe the investment is in another area or the focus is in another area, we let it sit for a while or we shift direction? I mean, I'm, I'm all for pushing it forward if we think now is the time and the opportunity, but I would hate to just continue to do what we've been doing for the past 20 years, hoping that we get a different result. Starting in 2012 and 15 and now again tonight, we're really talking about shaking things up. Um, we stood we stood pat for 10 years um, thinking that this utopian vision of the corporate mm -hmm. campus was going to build and that just was not going to happen. And it was only then that we, we started to kind of loosen things up and here we are still with not much development interest. Do you want to walk us forward on where you think you'd like to go now, timeline and uh, the method by which we complete our review and analysis? Yeah, sure. Well, the first stage is, you know, I, again, we don't want to be waiting. We think that there, there's a new story to tell about Hygis. We may find that it's not matching up with folks again, but we think there's some, some new threads, new ideas about Hygis that we can work with now. And um, we have... Um, we and maybe some incentives that we'll have to exactly. come back to you on, whether it's tips or administrative reviews. I think that's part of the rebranding as well. Right, right. Um, I, I do think it's about streamlining and looking, looking at the process. We've been tinkering with uses, but let's see if we can make it easier to develop. Um, not just, you know, we, I think we've, we've gone a long way towards adding flexibility in terms of uses and in terms of, of development. Now let's, let's tinker with some other pieces of it, um, you know, right now. And I think that's what you're going to see next is, I would imagine, what, what constitutes an administrative review. Uh, in other words, um, you know, how do we work with the planning, how do we streamline um, for these properties that have been looked at and looked at and looked at in every which way, you know, um, there is, um, how much can we really let, let happen at the staff level? And I think that's a real incentive. Um, and we'll find out. That's part of what we haven't really done before, is work on that side. Um, so there, there's some of that, and we're, I've already um, um, engaging uh, with our, we do have a firm that we work with um, who does a lot of our um, uh, market and um, ad work, and so we're working with them to develop you know, a new campaign based on a couple of different themes. And, and that's really what's going to be next. And they include, uh, you know, changing the name, uh, really kind of starting all over yeah. in many respects. Because I think, the, I think the area is stigmatized. Right. And we need to really try I mean, to right. right. what, I, I, what I'd like to get a sense of is, I mean, you can sit tight and say you hope something right. will exactly. happen. Uh, because it's an important piece, as Tom pointed out, and you don't want to really just give, <laughs> give up or right. give in. Right. Uh, on the other hand, the changes that we saw historically added were thoughtful. Uh, and some of the ideas that are now being put forward, again, they don't turn the apple cart completely upside down. Right. Uh, but uh, I, I would say, given the long history of limited success, mm -hmm. then continuing to be proactive is a better strategy than kind of standing pat. Right. I, I would like to point out that the, the changes that you made in 2012 um, did allow the two buildings that we that, that have been built there. Um, um, Horizon could not have been built unless we had made those um, changes to 2012. Um, same with um, the salt pump climbing uh, mm -hmm. company. That would not have been built but for those changes that were made. Um, and let's so not forget about the 450 odd acres right next door of Scarborough yeah, Downs, Downs right. property that has tremendous develop, development potential right. as well. Right. So I would like to see this advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I get a sense that everyone else uh, has expressed a right. similar view. So and I do think that an element of flexibility in that what comes along may not always fit perfectly right. into the zoning. Uh, but yet it's from a overall point of view, not inconsistent right. with our goals. Right. Right. And so flexibility, I think, is probably a watchword. Exactly. So the quick, the quick takeaway is that from a land use point of view, we think that maybe the larger discussion can and should wait for the comprehensive plan. 
but for this multifamily piece. Right. In the near term, we are going to be coming back to you, hopefully with a package of incentives to maybe help free some life and in a, in a, in a rebranding. And I expect we can do that uh, later in the fall. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a short term turnaround. Right. Right. Anyone else want to add anything? Are we all set? No. Thank you, Karen. Sure. Thank That's you. Great. <laughs> we'll adjourn momentarily and commence the meeting. Thank you.
Good evening, everybody. This is the August 17th, 2016 Town Council meeting. And if uh, uh, you would, let's please be called to order and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> A roll call, please. Councilor Bayvine? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Katarina? Present. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Piazzo? Here. Chairman Donovan? Here. Uh, Councilor St. Clair has, uh, I think, some babysitting issues that have t tested her ability to be here tonight. <laughs> uh, otherwise, all uh, assembled. Uh, general public comments, please. Anything that is not on the agenda for this evening, uh, please approach the podium and uh, speak your mind. Minutes of July 20, 2016, regular meeting. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Discussion? Comments? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, adjustments to the agenda, none at this time. Uh, items to be signed with treasurer's warrants are in order and will be signed uh, later in the meeting. Uh, order 16-49, 6 p.m. public hearing on the new request from Emily uh, Duno Wheeler for a combined massage establishment, massage therapist, DBA, Empower Massage Therapy, located at 51 U.S. Route 1. Uh, do I have a motion? Move, public hearing. Move approval. Okay. Thank you. Second? Second. Second. Uh, any uh, public comment on this matter? See none. Close that uh, discussion on the motion. Councilor, I keep reiterating this every time it comes up. Samples. <laughs> Samples. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking we have more massage therapists per capita than right. anyone. I know. I know. And it goes along with banks. He's going for the median <laughs> yeah. of the council. Uh, <laughs> uh, very good, uh, Councilor. Discussion. Doty, all in order. Yes. Uh, anything further? Nothing? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, new business. Uh, order number 16-50. First reading and referred to the Planning Board for a public hearing the proposed amendment to Chapter 405, uh, the Zoning Ordinance Section, Roman numeral 17B, Hagus Parkway District. Uh, we have uh, uh, the public present, and I think... Uh, Karen Martin, the head of our SEDCO Corporation, will introduce this matter to us. Thank you, Karen. Once again, I apologize for not being Dan Bacon, the planning director. He is um, <laughs> out this week, so um, if you will uh, bear with me, I will try to walk you through this. Um, this amendment to the Hygus Parkway um, is one that reflects a, a change to the density requirements for multifamily um, within the district. This is an amendment that is very similar to um, the amendments that we've talked about um, and, and you have approved in previous residential and the, and the town and village uh, center categories, where what we're doing is really removing the density uh, restriction on a per building basis. So in other words, we are keeping a footprint um, for the building at, at least in the Hygis Parkway, um, at 12,500, but we are not having any um, density requirement or density restriction. So in other words, you can build smaller units, you can um, have a little bit more flexibility in terms of development. This is what we've done again in some of the other uh, zones, and we wanted to bring Highgate Parkway up to that consistency. Again, just a uh, reminder that the underlying um, density for the zone itself remains unchanged. Um, so we're, we're not changing the overall density, we're just talking about um, how those units are getting built and the, the structures within, within the area. Um, one category that we, or one more amendment that we are bringing forward um, as part of this is a change in the height restriction. Um, we did want to um, keep the residential units um, at, I believe it's 45 feet, uh, three stories, 
and that was just a, I felt it was more consistent with some of the other um, zones in terms of residential. Um, so again, this removes the um, unit requirement, the density requirement per structure, um, establishes a footprint for the structure, um, and it limits the height for residential development. Questions for Karen? Thank you, Karen. Uh, public comment. Uh, anyone wishing to address this proposed zoning amendment, uh, please approach the podium. Uh, good, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Ben Devine. Uh, I am a uh, commercial developer and have developed uh, significant properties in um, Scarborough, including Scarborough Gallery. Um, I was uh, able to sit through on the workshop and I applaud uh, this council uh, examining uh, potential amendments to uh, uh, give uh, development uh, uh, potential to the, the Hagus Parkway. Um, I think these amendments are <coughs> in order. Um, I, uh, as a developer, am examining uh, uh, a property in that zone and uh, believe that uh, there could be additional um, amendments and relief that this uh, council could provide, um, specifically the 60-40 split. Um, however, um, I think uh, uh, the, the uh, amendments that Karen's put forth are in the uh, best interest of the development community and the town. I would just like to uh, ask that the, the council uh, continue to uh, work on uh, on uh, potential amendments that could uh, could hasten development and be in the best interest of the town. I think you'll be hearing more from uh, my group and potentially other groups as we look at uh, opportunities on the Hagus Parkway. Thanks. Thank you for your input. Uh, anyone else wishing to address the council on this motion? Seeing none, uh, I'll accept the motion. Move approval. Second. Uh, discussion. Who would like to start? Will. So I guess what, what jumps out at me is I'm a little confused and I heard um, Karen say that uh, the 45-foot the height cap kind of brings it in line with the other, um, I guess, other areas in town. Um, but I guess my question is, if it's a 45-foot building that's residential next to a 75-foot building that's commercial, I guess I don't, I don't quite understand why we would draw that distinction there. If, if you can have a 75-foot building, why, why limit the use? Well, come on. This, yeah, I think the theory there is that a six-story residential building really takes on a different, it becomes really an apartment building. Um, I, think, I think scale does matter, slope roof, those sorts of things. Uh, that's really, I believe, what, what's behind that. And it appears to match with the development community's needs. So I don't, I'm not aware, I've not been told that, that will be an impediment, that that's actually um, workable for them. Thank you. Other comments? Councilor Bayline. So um, I'm confused as well um, on that same topic, but one other additional. So. Uh, and I guess I just, um, because I'm not on the planning board, so I don't really get into that detail, but I agree with Councilor Rowan. Um, so you could have a six-story non-residential building next to a three-story residential building, technically. So does that go through, I take it that must go through uh, some type of review process and it's not allowed as a result of that re review process? It may or may not. It would be something. All I can picture, and, and by the way, the reason why I, I was, I can picture, you've seen those uh, pictures where you have these big, tall buildings, and then you get this little tiny house because the person didn't want to sell. Uh, <laughs> it kind of has that awkward, you know, and that's what you kind of look, that's what you think about when you think about the wording that's here. So that's why, you know, I picked up on that as well. So, I mean, does the review process prevent that from happening? I would say it prevents it, but I think it would consider impacts, whether it's shadow, you know, light impacts mm. or, or what have you. Uh, that sort of scenario strikes me it would be the same developer that's proposing a residential and commercial component. So I, I would expect their proposal would take those matters into consideration. Right. Okay. Um, right. And, and sure, in, the, in our discussions, I think um, uh, Dan Bacon, the planning director, was very concerned about having um, that large of a scale of residential um, development that 
um, the, the 45 feet really did match, uh, match better with um, some of the research that he did in terms of suburban residential development. Um, I agree, you know, it, it's always potentially, um, it's possible that you could have somebody come in with that, but I think as far as um, you'd be doing a plan development and I think there would be work through the planning board to talk about compatibility and all of that. Oh, can she? St I have one yes, follow-up. You don't please. mind? If she can stay. She seems to be the most uh, knowledgeable. <laughs> um, so the other piece is in 26 and 27, where we take out the number of units and replace it with a maximum building footprint of 12.5. Mm -hmm. Is that the maximum footprint for the multifamily dwellings within the building, or is it the total? Because the way that it reads, it sounds like you can have a foot, um, residential footprint of 12,500 within a mixed-use building, which based upon if you then allowed another 12,500, that's a 25,000 square foot building. So right. The, so the, the way that it reads. Look at that. The intent is for the entire size of the building to be 12,500. Yeah. Maximum Correct. building footprint. Correct. Match, let's see. It just said it. Oh, I used to live in a three-story one. Is, uh, I'm just saying the way that it's written, <coughs> it could be confused that it's, it's residential dwellings take up 12,500 square feet. So if they can look at that, the planning board can look at that. I'd be happy to refer it to the board. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Let's uh, let's let's make sure we've got the. Yeah, I just want to make sure on that, but but the support it. I just sure, want to make sure, it's, sure. there's no the loophole. I guess. Right. The intent is that the structure itself is 12,500. Right. Mm -hmm. Jay Marie, uh, this and this may be covered too, but it popped into my head. What if I were a developer that came in and said I wanted a mixed use in one building, and I'm going to have both the commercial and residential? Because mm -hmm. I see that in other planned communities around the country that I've been to. Mm -hmm. um, so is this covered here, or is that a? Oh. That's a legitimate question. Yes, you you can do you can do uh, mixed use within a building. But it, but then, what's your limit on height? And um, it's a good question. Central. Paragraph twenty-six deals. Yeah. Twenty-six deals, I believe, deals with the mixed-use building. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it would depend whether the residential is on the first three. But it doesn't talk about the height. Course. I mean, I, and I know I'm just asking without. It would be kind no, of a funny-looking building, right. but. Right. <laughs> no, it, you know it. It, it, it implies, and I they usually interpret to the strictest uh, um, category. I mean, if it's if there's a residential use, you are going to be limited to the 45 feet. But I'd rather not have implication or okay. you know loopholes sure. that someone can drive right. a truck through if if that's right. not what we intend as a yeah. as a community. I would I would yeah. read this. I would interpret this as the residential use. If there's residential use in the mixed use building, it's it's um, limited to the 45. Uh, feet, but I think that's a good question for for the planning staff, and we'll make sure that we okay. That'd be um, great. How, do, how do you feel sure about the the issue of yeah. uh, first floor? Because oftentimes you'll see first floor commercial, right? Uh, <coughs> first retail of some fashion, and uh, second, third, fourth floors and up are residential. Yeah. I know my sister lives in Daniel Island, uh, in Charleston, and so there are some buildings there that actually are. There's a couple of floors that are commercial use, mm -hmm. i.e., you know, maybe attorney's offices and dentists and this and that and the other thing. And then there's another floor or whatever. Of course, they've got pretty strict height thing, but of residential above that. Um, but anyway, that's just one of the things I thought of. So. Right. Right. Well, worth, it, worth having you and Dan, uh, Tom, sure. think about mm -hmm. right. whether uh, uh, in a mixed-use setting you want to set a different standard or a more flexible standard. Because okay. I'd love to see something like that, but that's me. Uh, you know. other, other questions? Chris? Yeah. So, I mean, it strikes me we have those examples in Portland. Uh, you've got a lot of commercial use for a second floor with mm -hmm. residential above that, especially the downtown district. I, I kind of read this that uh, they define what residential use is in paragraphs 24 through 28. Um, and that, to me, if I'm interpreting this properly, any time you have not, uh, residential, non-commercial, or mixed use, you are limited to 45 feet, period. So you, the scenario I think that you guys were talking about with a six-story with commercial on the first two floors, you, you, you couldn't do a, a six-foot according to this. Um, so I guess you know my question would be from a development standpoint would be would that cause people to not want to put 
the residential in, or what was the purpose of the 45 foot restriction? Was it just aesthetics, or was it more from a developmental standpoint that we really wanted commercial only in a, in a taller structure? Okay. And, and I think to elaborate, if we did a mixed use six stories with two or three first floors commercial, I mean, to me, that becomes an aesthetics issue. Right? <coughs> so I, I would support this just as, as, a, as a way to try and see what comes forth for development. Right. Um, I would, uh, my concern, only concern would be that limitation might discourage a mixed use. I don't know. Mm -hmm. We okay. certainly can get Dan Bacon to have input um, yeah. before you consider Good this point. further. Yeah. And that question could be answered at the planning board should this move forward. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions? All set? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> uh, order number 1651, first reading and uh, schedule a public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 302, the Scarborough Town Council Rules, Policies, and Procedures Manual. Uh, anyone wishing to comment? On this, please approach the podium. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Uh, discussion. I think the way to approach this, uh, 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 Councilor Babine has put a lot of work <laughs> into, into this effort, as well as the Rules and Policies Committee. Uh, but I would like to let uh, Councilor Babine kind of take the lead uh, he has outlined uh, the substantive and non-substantive provisions. I think we have all got copies of those in front of us. And uh, Sean, you may want to uh, comment, but it may well be that people may want to simply ask questions of Sean on this, um, flexible as to how we handle this. So Sean, you want to start and then we'll... Um, actually, if I could defer uh, for a moment to maybe the, if the chair or the committee would like to summarize anything from the committee's perspective. Sure. If, if you want to, I didn't want to step over him. No, 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 it's fine. He led this whole group. <laughs> <laughs> I might have done a little bit of the work, but he led the. <laughs> no, no, I, Sean, I really appreciate. I mean, this. You know, Was that a mic, a mic drop? I heard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate all the effort, and, and as, as, as the chair said, you put a ton of effort into doing this. This, this. Spreadsheet you've put is great. I mean, I think the only thing I'd add is, you know, we work as a committee. We, we've been working on this for spring into the summer, and I think we're all kind of in agreement and support the things that are on here. So with that, I'll turn it back to however you'd like to proceed. So for the public's uh, awareness, uh, just identify your committee. Um, it's, it's the Rules and, and Policy Committee that we've been meeting, and membership the, is the membership is Sean Babine, Will Rowan, and myself. No, good. Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, so first, I, I do want to say thanks to the committee uh, for uh, um, um, hearing through all of these recommendations because I, I did uh, enter this. This is my first year ever on the rules and policy, so it was a great lesson. Um, so what I've presented really is a four-page table. It's a little bit in larger fonts because some of us are getting older and our eyesight is uh, weaning. Um, so I apologize for the length of this. But what I've done is I've tried to um, categorize things into two major categories, which are su non-substantive issues and then substantive issues. And really the distinction is that the substantive issues might require, it does not necessarily mean they have to have some type of strategic discussion or a discussion about why it's important to make that change. And it could vary from person to person about it, uh, the need to do so or how to do so, where the non-substantive are really uh, grammatical changes to keep up with times with uh, policy language or corrections of punctuation and title changes or corrections and things like that. So um, to quickly go over the non-substantive. Um, so in addition to um, those categorizations, um, I've also identified what type of change is being requested in a particular group, uh, what the document located, and we'll make this available online as well for others. So where in the document is it located um, by page and by um, title? Um, what is the consideration that was being asked? And then really a, an abbreviated, tried to not editorialize explanation, um, as well as try to keep um, it not verbose why um, the change is being recommended. So as an example, the first item is really just a, a change in the title. Um, so currently 
the current title of this um, section 202, or chapter 202, is the Town Council's Rules, Policies, and Procedures Manual. However, if you actually look at the structure of um, one, the committee by itself is only called Rules and Policies, so it's not even consistent with that. Two, with the content of what's in the document, it was not consistent as well. So we are recommending that um, policies are a distinct classification that are, not, that are actually located in Chapter 101 of the ordinance. So in that chapter, if you go to it, you'll see um, there's a fiscal policy, there's um, pesticide use policy, there is a social media policy, mm -hmm. there's 13, 14, 15 different policies that um, we have set forth, we being the council, and that's where policies, so there's really no policies within this document. Um, they really are uh, procedures. Um, I just wanted to mention that this section really deals with general rules of the council and how it conducts business. Um, there's other grammatical changes um, and label capitalization, so like a rules of order, um, because it is a classification or, or an actual title, you know, the R needs to be capitalized and the order needs to be capitalized. So it's kind of like those minor things. I'm not going to go through all of them. One item that is um, kind of important, um, but it's, I classified as non-substantive, is the elimination of what is being listed in, our, um, in that section as consent agendas. The mm -hmm. council does actually not use consent agendas. Uh, for the public, a consent agenda really groups the routine, procedural, and information and self-explanatory non-controversial items into one action. Um, they do not require discussion or strategic thoughts such as formally written committee reports, um, and they're grouped into one motion to be entered into the record. So as an example, you'd enter in maybe the Finance Committee report, the Energy Committee's report, um, uh, financial reports that have already been reviewed and accepted by the Finance Committee. Um, as well as minutes um, that are general in nature, and just vote on them once rather than doing them individually. We don't use that process, so we uh, are recommending to eliminate that in its reference um, everywhere throughout the documents. Um, the other non-substantive items, um, there's only three others. There's some relabeling. Um, there's also um, uh, setting limitations for council member comments. Uh, some might consider that a little bit more substantive than uh, as generic as I have, but this has been a standing rule of the council for a few years, um, and I remember being part of a council uh, for many years in which um, you could literally be here 20 minutes listening to council, and even longer, council member comments at the end of the day. So we have been respectful and we keep that to 10 minutes, and that just simply puts it into the document, acknowledging what our practice is. And then the last one is, um, the use of town, I, I classified this as non-substantive, it's the use of town letterhead and the correspondence policy. Um, easiest way to explain this is to tell the story. Um, back in the day, we didn't have social media, we didn't have Twitter, Facebook, um, let alone email. I don't, even, I don't believe we even had email. So council members literally got a package of town letterhead in which it could use for correspondence that created um, some um, angst among some people because of what was being written on those and whether that opinion was being expressed on behalf of the entire council or just an individual member, that which created the disclosures issue that's also in there. And um, the fact is that we live in a um, very different society today in which letterhead is definitely not a consideration. Um, so we are recommending the elimination of the town letterhead policy as well as the correspondence policy. Um, and I think the explanation there is um, is pretty simple. So with the non-substantive pieces, I would recommend, Mr. Chairman, that if the council was willing is to uh, move approval of all items that are correct, characterized as non-substantive as one motion. Um, and I can answer any questions if that is the will of the council. So you'd like to divide the question? Yes. Unless, they, unless others don't have questions or don't, it's up to you guys. Councilor Kettering. Is this where I can ask a question? I just have a question regarding yeah. consent agendas. Yes. Uh, if we take that out of the policy, are we tying the hands of a future council who may wish to institute right. that? Right. Exactly. So my personal comment on that is no, because as um, we've learned with the state legislature, any governing body can break its own rules. <laughs> Um, and conduct that. business as it is needed. And I'm being both uh, sarcastic but also realistic about that because that is true. Um, second is that there's nothing that says they can't change the policy in the future to yeah. add that if they so moved. That was my only question. Uh, and unless there's uh, some concern over the substantive or non-substantive matters, I say I'm fine having them all entertained in a single motion unless 
No, I'd, I'd like to discuss the, substan the uh, substantive one separately, if we could, please. Good. So we can split the we have a, the, is that a second to Sean's motion I to divide the question? Yeah. 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 Uh, Thank you. None. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Uh, let's deal with the non substantive issues. Is there. No. Okay, yes, sorry, go because we're That was a motion to divide the question. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Because we're not, we now have uh, 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 two motions. Yep. The first is to uh, approve uh, first reading and schedule of public hearing and second reading on the proposed. Uh, non-substantive changes, right. uh, if I'm correct. Uh, and uh, is there any further comment before we vote on that? All in favor? Opposed? Uh, and now I'll have a, uh, just for the record, a new motion on the substantive matters. Um, I would move approval to accept um, the substantive matters. Thank um, you. Second? Second. Thank you, Peter. Uh, discussion, Sean. So for explanation, uh, and I'll take these, um, um, it sounds like I'll, I should take these one at a time and then accept questions and then yeah, I think you, you want to do that? Yeah, because I think your uh, analysis and explanation is good. And if there are questions, uh, and I do think there are going to be questions that uh, we'll direct them to Sean. Uh, I think the first one is authorization for resolves and proclamations. Any questions on that? I think, Sean. Um, so I would like to at least, um, uh, for the or at least for the public, because we are on TV, is to explain what that does. Go right ahead, and then we can. Go right so in. this authorizes the council chair and town manager to sign resolves and proclamations that recognize individual accomplishments only. So the concern, uh, the uh, attention that this brought forward was, um, there are a lot of men and women in this community and organizations that do a lot of work, and sometimes recognizing them as time sensitive because um, a lot of volunteers have a lot of work and sometimes forget uh, I want a resolution to be able to recognize. I got into that um, recognizing, I think it was Breast Cancer Week a couple months ago, um, or Women's Cancer Week, I can't remember exactly, but, um, or individual people mm -hmm. that you want to surprise them because there is a special function at, whether it's the Kiwanis or whatever the group is, and you don't want it to be on an agenda in advance. And I think that um, when we recognize, personally, when we recognize an individual, um, there should always be an opportunity to do so, um, and I think that both the council chair, regardless of who the council chair is and the manager, will have discretion in making sure that it's appropriate to represent the town as a whole. Anyone wish to express a concern about that? No. Good. The next one, Sean, if you would address that one. Sure. Um, the next one is um, it's, um, it's to identify council action items by sponsor and committee actions and recommendations. This impacts section 108.2 and 108.2a. This would require that all ordinances, orders, resolves, and proclamations identify the sponsor, um, which is, would be a specific <coughs> counselor or a staff member, as well as if the item has been referred to the council committee, as well as list the committee's recommendation. Um, the reason um, this was purely, um, um, I will state as part of the, um, the personal statement, is that I initiated that. And the reason is that there are actually two ways in which you can actually introduce actions for the council to take. An individual counselor can actually um, make a recommendation and submit it to the town clerk on their own without it actually being referred to a committee, um, as well as an item generally being worked through a committee. And I think that in a time in which we're being asked to be more transparent, to be more communicative, as well as, um, as, as, well as uh, using the expertise and advocacy of those who are putting the work forward, um, this helps us um, identify all of those and, and promotes a better, I think, a better council. Thank you. Questions or concerns relating to this matter? Uh, the next one, uh, Sean, please. Sure. The next <laughs> item increases thresholds regarding reading of two separate days and a waiver um, for yeas and nays being taken. And what this deals with is um, this was last amended. This is, <laughs> I had to put that in there. In 1977, um, the change would increase the monetary threshold for the readings of ordinance and orders where we spend more than $1,000 in that action. The current, um, or the current um, policy or procedure says it's $500. Um, so what that says is that if there is an order, ordinance, or resolve that gets passed, there has to be two readings if it is greater than $500 today. We said with the time, with the, uh, time value of money, um, let's um, be a little bit more realistic um, in today's business world, we increase it to 1000 
I did want to mention, although it wasn't part of discussion, I did look up, and in, based on inflation from 1977, um, $500 in 1977 has the same buying power, the same power of $2,032 today. <laughs> so this is somewhat gets us a little closer, doesn't necessarily get us to par, but um, it's more about uh, making it easier to get our work done. Thank you. Uh, questions or concerns about this matter? Mm -mm. See none. Sean, take the next one. Thank you. Uh, next item, um, this is a change to council committee descriptions in the context in which they function. It impacts section 203, uh, specifically three members of the finance committee. Um, the cha uh, this changes the intent of the work to be completed by the finance committee. The prior language limits the finance committee's review, and I am an underlie that because it is specific within the policy, review of appropriations to all departments except the Department of Education. <coughs> Um, the intent is that this provides consistency to actual practices and to the intent of the law with the recent changes in developing a joint approach to budgeting. This section's language, even as it's recommended and its change, remains a work in process. Um, uh, the personal side to this is that um, I personally had a conflict with the way the policy read because it said that the Finance Committee should not review, basically should not review any appropriations at all of the, except for the total appropriation of the school department. But yet for 20 years that I've been around, we've always looked at generally major categories. We don't look at the line items. It's, you know, how much is total education, um, how much is maybe high school education versus middle school versus the different areas, the major components. Um, and so the change is purely a recommenda recommendation um, while staying within the intent and the boundaries of the charter uh, to what our current practices are. Thank you. Comments or questions on this? Mr. Gaza. So this was obviously the one I've been waiting yes. for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would never Sorry to them. make the council sit through those other ones first. Um, yeah, this uh, actually came up. I, I had uh, some comments and concerns about this one um, from uh, a few school board members as well. I understand the intent there, um, and I understand how the, the process works. I, I'm really concerned about the wording there because um, my initial interpretation of reading this is that, yes, we will review them, but if we can only pass on, we can adjust, we can only pass on recommendations up or down, does that become part of the overall uh, recommendation of the Finance Committee, or are we breaking them out separately? Uh, and if so, um, we, I don't really know what our authority is as a town Finance Committee to modify or adjust those uh, those educational line items. I know we can work with the school finance committee to request that they make those modifications and adjustments, um, and I think that's kind of how we've been trying to do that in the past, but I don't know if there's really any, I, I don't know what authority we would have with this changing. So um, I don't really have an alternative proposal for wording. Um, suffice to say that I, I, we obviously need to stay within the confines of the law, um, for sure, and um, I would like to see that maybe looked at a little bit more uh, thoroughly and come up with some better wording for that. I, I looked at it and I thought I liked it because it made clear that we were not looking at line items in the Department of Education yeah. budget. And I liked it because it made clear that we're not limited to just the bottom line. While we end up setting the bottom line, it's, you cannot set a bottom line without at least having a sense of whether or not you can support the overall direction in which that budget is going. Uh, and because they could be doing things that you go, whoa, it'd be very difficult for me to, to, to get behind that. So I could see why you would want to have your finance committee have the discretion to at least uh, uh, have some broader discretion. Right, so the, so the question, and again, and I don't dis necessarily disagree with that. Um, I think that is our purview as the Finance Committee is to look at the town's expenses period and the town's budget period. My concern would be what kind of uh, action is coming out of this committee? So yes, we review it, that's typical. We, we do that anyway. Um, if we don't like that number as a Finance Committee, it's an up or down vote, right? So. The recommendation, as it's written here, would be a recommendation would come out of finance to the to the council of either ought ought to pass unanimously, ought to pass, ought not to pass, or ought not to pass unanimously. So that doesn't really give us any kind of adjustment. What it really says is 
Um, the Finance Committee just didn't like that number, and we're going to debate that at the council level anyway, right? So I guess what I'm looking at is um, I, I prefer to see that as um, not having that discussion necessarily taken up and decided at the finance level, because that is still going to come to the committee, no matter, the, the full council, no matter what. Um, I think the way we've worked it out now is that we have those discussions back and forth of what the expectations are of the school department with their budget, why they're presenting it. We ask questions, we discuss options and things like that. I would be more comfortable with that discussion coming out with an adjustment on the school's budget presentation, not the Finance Committee making that determination. If they don't make that determination, we still have the option um, in the full council of saying we've reviewed it and we're not comfortable with that as individual counselors, and, and that's why. So I guess my concern is, is I, I don't want any of those decisions or those line item adjustments necessarily be made at the finance level. I think that's something that... that but it, it specifically says they're not, they're not going to be made, uh, line item appropriations are not going to be made at the finance. All they're doing is reviewing the appropriations so, then so that it gives you the opportunity to understand the bottom line in context. So help me that, understand then what my comes, So what comes out of the finance committee then on the recommendations? Is that the overall town budget with our adjustments that because the finance committee looks at things and we make adjustments, right? We 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 make recommendations for adjustments for the council to approve. So what would come out of the finance committee based on this policy then? Would it be a recommended pass, not pass for the school portion, and then a recommended pass, not pass for municipal? Or would it be one overall recommendation that basically says so the whole budget? Because the Finance Committee does make a recommendation on a total appropriation. Uh, and it may be different than what was presented in second reading uh, and, and approved at second reading by the Board of Education. So, I mean, that's, and that's based on the collective judgment of the Finance Committee. Sean? So, I think, the, and, and Chris, I know you'll tell me if I'm not right. Um, no, I wouldn't. And I say that with a respect, <laughs> believe me. No, no, I, your opinion does matter a lot. So, I, so um, I'm confused by the intent of the discussion because if the concern is about what is coming out of as a recommendation from the committee, that deals with um, identifying the council action items by sponsor and committee actions and recommendations, not by reviewing the la not by reviewing the actual appropriations. So, the, so the recommend you, you stress that the concern is about the recommendation that comes out of the committee. That recommendation is in, in a different section. It has nothing to do with this section. This section has to do with what. Um, I don't want to say authority, but what responsibility the Finance Committee has mm -hmm. in looking at the school budget, or looking at the school budget and what level. The way it's currently worded, which is not today's practices and hasn't been for a while, is that um, it says in the policy, we are not to review the school department's appropriations, only the total appropriation. Mm -hmm. So as the chair of the Finance Committee, I would sit there and say, all I need to see is what is the total amount that they're spending and not look at any other value that's within their budget. None whatsoever because the policy says that we're not supposed to do that. So I changed this to reflect what we have um, agreed to in the past several years and actually gotten better at it um, and more respectful at it over particularly the last two. So um, I agree with you around the line item piece and, and, and unfortunately when you abbreviate the intent, it doesn't tell you the exact language, and the, the exact language to read it on the changes, it says the Finance Committee shall review appropriation requests and re revenue estimates for all offices, agencies, and departments of the town, including the Department of Education, period. The Finance Committee shall prepare recommended line item appropriation amendments with the exception of the Department of Education budget to the proposed budget to the Town Council prior to the public he hearing and final reading. The Finance Committee shall recommend only a total appropriation for the Department of Education. So it's completely out of the line item conversation um, and has been for at least two years. I hope we never go to that line item. We have enough line items to talk about on our own side. 
So, so again, I, I, I would ask the question, um, what kind of, what would we be looking at, what would that recommendation out of finance look like? Would it look like one recommendation for the entire budget with the school included, or would it look at one recommendation municipal and then a separate recommendation for, minute, for, yeah. for school? Tom, this year, if you could, was it one recommendation that came out or was it two? Because it's two, it's, two, it's two values that we approve within the... I think it's two separate ones. I think that's a different question. It's not even being proposed to be changed. I, I think the difference is review as opposed to recommend. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. you're trying to just appreciate the... On the, the, on, the line, on the appropriation side, it's to review those line item appropriations at whatever level the committee decides. I hope it's at right. the global level. Right. Um, and then it has to make its recommendation, whether it's combined with the town or whether it's independent, I think depends upon the finance committee's um, decision on how it's being presented. I hope it's... Yeah, I mean, the charter's silent to, as to whether it's a separate recommendation, but it's very clear that it's a bottom line recommendation as regards... And Chris, the just, just, I agree with you. It should be... I personally, it worked very well where we came out of committee and said we're recommending one number. It's one budget, one community, and that's how we took it, even though the final question on the agenda was separated into two. You have to yeah, for the, the referendum. Order, right. Right. The order has education, municipal, uh, capital. Right. Reported separately and then rolled into one combined number at the bottom for net appropriation. So we are recommending a figure that goes on the referendum. So we would see two separate recommendations then coming out it of the could. Finance. We would see, because we don't, obviously we, we can't discuss line items, but let's use arbitrary numbers. Let's say it's a $40 million school request. Yep. Uh, we review that in finance and we determined uh, uh, we only want to appropriate $38 million. Uh, the recommendation would go to the council then. Would it be the total town budget of 70 plus million or would it be the recommendation for the school budget would be 38 million and the recommendation for the town budget would be whatever we've adjusted and corrected separately? Actually, now that I think about it, Tom, I think at the, fi at the committee level this past year, um, we did actually approve two numbers. I believe we did. I think I we think actually did committee. approve two numbers at the end, right. a total appropriation to schools and then um, the, the other items based upon their um, Mm -hmm. Now that I think about it, that would only be appropriate so the council right. understood clearly what right. the recommendation of the committee mm -hmm. is. Yeah, and I don't think that's um, conflicting at all with this language. No. More importantly, with the charter. Yeah. Any further comment uh, on that matter? Mm -hmm. We'll keep moving. John, you want to take the next one? Sure. Uh, the next item is changes to the council committee's description. Uh, regarding three members of Rules and Policies Committee uh, to change the policy scope. I'm trying to remember what this was. Wait a second. Oh, um, so currently in the Rules and Policy, it says that, it specifically states that the only responsibility of the committee is to look at Chapter 302. However, the committee has traditionally been the author of or at least reviewer of recommendations for Chapter 101, which are the policies for the town. <laughs> and so this simply is a change that changes the scope to be consistent with what it currently practices and has for 20 years. Comments or questions concerning this item? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, uh, take the next one, Sean, please. Um, the next item um, increases the council chair's authority to act in section 203. Um, what this does is really um, a common practice that's happened again for 20 years that I know of, um, where the council chair is an ex officio member of all council standing committees. It does not state that actually um, up to now. It has not stated that in that uh, policy. But it also authorizes um, that person to vote in the absence of any regular member. Again, it's about respect and about getting the work done. Um, we've had um, situations with that are unpredictable and unfortunate, but um, where members might be sick or um, and things just simply need to get done. So only in the cases of emergency and discretion would the chair then act in that capacity if someone was absent so the work can move forward. Comments uh, on that one? Uh, I, I have found that the, I think the chairman, car chairperson, carries the responsibility of being aware of who is unable to attend and needs to use their best effort to attend so as to have a quorum, a working committee in every instance. So I, I support this. Further comments on this one? 
Mm -hmm. so take the next one, please. Sure. And the last one is changes to the travel policy, um, tra travel policy to reimbursements. My, uh, I obviously typed this up in a very quick fashion. That's the travel policy, the conference workshop, expenditures, request for advance payments, and reimbursements. Um, there was some incorrect titling within that, um, but the fact is we're eliminating a significant part of that. Again, this goes back to one of those uh, funny stories, I guess, <laughs> um, in a way, um, from 20 years ago. Um, but the, the thing is, is that uh, times have changed, the town has changed, so the contingency fund for the town uh, council has uh, decreased significantly. I want to say it's less than a thousand bucks, and maybe even less than 750. Um, but in the past, uh, councilors would go to conferences, national conferences. Um, and um, everything from plane tickets to hotels to other um, incidental expenditures, and that's a broad title for what was being spent, um, could be submitted. There was a process. Um, basically, the change says that um, the Finance Committee will approve, as part of its budget, not approve, but will recommend the contingency for the Town Council to going forward, as it has always, um, that the policy We've gotten rid of all of these exceptions to the rules and processes where the town manager had to jump through hoops to get things done. Is basically the town manager will process any requests consistent with the standard operating procedures of the town for every other employee. Um, so if the money is there, then the money can be appropriated uh, based upon, um, at this point, it's the t town manager's, dis manager's discretion. But with 650 bucks in the budget, um, that is obviously very limited. But it's an outdated source given today's environment, thankfully. I just want to point out, it's not entirely at my discretion. It's subject to the existing rules for all town employees. Right. Sorry. Yes. yes. Comments concerning that? Mm -hmm. See none. Uh, uh, oh, any further comments before we vote? Yeah. I just want to, just uh, um, so first again, thanks. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Councillor uh, Chiazzo's comment because it is important. I think the one thing that you can't regulate, you can't write into policy is how people are going to behave and how people must respect each other through the deliberations and the conversations that um, are undertaken. And I think that we have made significant grounds and I hope that every council after takes the same um, level of appreciation and um, consideration for our colleagues on the school board as part of that joint discussion around budgets um, and that it shouldn't be forgotten even though it might not necessarily be written Thank you. Further comments? Seeing none, uh, all in favor of the motion. Opposed? 5 1. Council Cases. Uh, order 1652 Act to adopt the fiscal year 2016 2017 school budget resolutions as required by state statute. Anyone wishing to comment on this, please approach the podium. Uh, may I have a motion? So Ooh. moved. Second. Second. Uh, discussion? Any, any comment uh, from the town manager on this? No, I uh, wish I could um, shed more light on this, other than the fact that state law does require uh, <coughs> us to, to, or you to take action to um, in accordance with these very specific um, appropriation categories, if you will. And so uh, the, s the school department has, and school board has come up w with this. This is obviously consistent with the bottom line approval that you've given. That's what I think the public needs yes. to know. Uh, any further comment? <coughs> Councilor Kays, uh, uh, Avon. I'm much better looking. Yes. I don't know how you got us confused. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> You talk a lot, though. <laughs> no. I, I think it's ironic that this actually follows um, with our prior discussion around the issue because here we are approving recommendations based upon specific classifications of expenses within the school ironic. budget. So the question I have is that if we can't review those, then why on earth are we now approving the allocations within those budgets? But that's being rhetorical because I understand state yeah. statute. Thanks. Councilor Rowan. Uh, I'm just curious. This is coming from the state. They, they've written this up to say that these are your sections and this is how much this is in no, alignment with the these EPS. Are the categories. Comes, these are the categories and aligned with the, the essential program service EPS. No, nothing to do with EPS. It's just these are the categories. This is how much you're spending. 
I don't know if it's for comparative purposes or reporting purposes, but Probably they, they reporting. I think it's them all. Someone the validation yeah. 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 Other comments? Wait. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Act on the request <laughs> from the deputy tax collector to authorize the town manager to sign a release deed on property located at 331 Pleasant Hill Road, map R099 slash lot 038. Anyone wishing to uh, speak to this matter in the public, uh, please approach the podium. Accept a motion. Move approval. Second. Uh, discussion, uh, town manager want to give any context? Simply there were, uh, there were liens placed on this property, they have all been satisfied, and so we now need to, to finalize the, the matter, uh, issue a release deed, uh, so the title is clear in that regard. Discussion. Councilor Bayland. So is there any way of creating a policy that says that you can be authorized going forward to automatically be able to do this without bringing it to the council? I'll check that. My suspicion is no, the mm -hmm. council's the only one that has the authority, uh, and I, frankly, I wouldn't recommend that. I, um, I mean, <coughs> I'll check into it, but I, I think despite the fact that it takes up time in your agenda and time in your meeting, I think it's important for the council to consider these one by one and issue mm -hmm. specific recommendations. We're, we're dealing with real estate and title issues, so I think as much clarity, um, the better. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. <coughs> Act on uh, this order 16-54. Act on the request for a mass gathering permit from Taylor Crab to hold the insane inflatable 5K on <laughs> Friday, September 16th and Saturday, September 17th at Scarborough Downs, located at 90 Payne Road. Any member of the public wishing to address this, please approach the podium. Uh, motion, please. Move approval. Second. Discussion. Chris. Uh, I'm, and I apologize, it may say something in one of the Chief Thurlow's uh, letters here. Um, is this a, a for-profit event or is it a fundraising event or what, what is this? Chief, you want to enlighten us on that? <clears throat> I'm not 100% sure. My understanding is it is a for-profit uh, firm. They do these all over the country, um, but I believe there is a component where they do raise funds for the benefit of a local uh, organization. I'm not sure who that is for this particular event. Okay. Right. It, d it doesn't impact my decision one way or another. I was just curious as what the purpose of it was. Good. And uh, all the paperwork is in order? It is. We, we have not finalized the, the nuts and bolts of all the agreements, but we do have written agreement that they are going to comply with the staff review's recommendations. And they've done this before here? Two years ago, they, oh, they yeah. uh, did a similar event. Satisfactory event from it, your it point of view? It did go satisfactorily and they're actually anticipating quite a few less participants mm. this mm. year for some reason. Uh, ticket sales have not been as robust mm. as they anticipated. The other value uh, of this uh, this venue is that it's kind of self-contained. They're able to kind of park on site. Uh, there's good <coughs> access uh, in and out so it doesn't put the sort of strain some of the other events uh, will do on the community and on uh, public safety. Thank you. Uh, other comments, questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Just as an aside, we, ha we have Thank seen you. an increasing amount of, uh, I guess it's a business anymore, for-profit um, types of groups, and some of the events can be uh, quite impactful in the community, yeah. whether it's you know a road race or a bike race closing down huge sections of your town. So um, just something to be aware of going forward. Non-action items, I don't believe there are any. Thank you. Uh, Standing special committee reports and layers or reports. Chris, let's start down with you. All right. Uh, so a couple things. Let's start with education first since it's a hot button issue for tonight. Um, you guys have in front of you, or excuse me, everybody has in front of them. Um, this is Superintendent Kuchenberger's uh, entry plan. This is what she discussed at uh, the last school board meeting. Uh, they have it in printed form. Um, so uh, they asked me to distribute it to council members. It will also be available to the general public either here in Town Hall or at Summerfest. Uh, so she will, uh, Superintendent Kuchenberger will be there as well. Um, 
they didn't really cover any other major issues at the last meeting. They're scheduled for tomorrow, so um, we'll, we'll see what the next item is for them. Um, for energy, we actually had a, a very productive meeting this morning. Um, we discussed um, a, a few things. The biggest one, really, that we looked at was a um, we reviewed the impact of the uh, composting collection point mm -hmm. um, for uh, the various ones around town. And we've actually taken, I think, uh, last year or 2016, we took out, excuse me, yeah, 2016, we took out uh, 7 million tons out of the waste stream. Um, and this year so far, um, seven. No, Not seven million. Five. I'm sorry, seven, seven tons. Seven tons. Sorry, excuse me. Yes. Pardon me. Uh, that was success. Yeah, <laughs> seven tons out of uh, May and June of last year, and then uh, 5.8 tons so far uh, this mm -hmm. month. So um, ultimately, it's a successful program so far. Um, we're looking at expanding that into a um, pilot program, working with Cathella to to implement that. There'll be some educational rollouts that'll come through. Um, we'll determine which neighborhood we've got it, I think, narrowed down to a couple different places, but um, as that becomes available, we'll certainly release that and there'll be a, an educational piece in front of that as well. So um, certainly we've seen positive results so far out of the composting program just from the local collection points, and the hope is that we'll see even uh, broader impact with uh, curbside collection. Uh, second thing was the solar report came out for um, for the town, um, and I apologize, I don't have the report in front of me. But I certainly make that available to, to council members if they choose. Um, uh, basically, the the report um, shows that the the, the uh, facility down at uh, the public works, um, or excuse me, community services down there by the um, the um, pond, is performing basically where we thought it was going to perform. Uh, there's some good data in there about the the amount of CO2 and and uh, carbon emissions and things like that that we've removed as a result of this project. Revenues, I think, are pretty much on par with with uh, what we expected them to be. Uh, and I think this is this year one, I think, of the report. Yes. So first full uh, year. First full year, yeah. So so no surprises. Um, everything seems to be going well. Um, nothing really to report there. And energy is going to continue to focus on um, certainly looking at the composting. Uh, curbside composting plan, as well as looking at the uh, general e energy policies. We'll start reviewing those as well, um, possibly with an eye towards the um, overall uh, development plan for the town. I was asked by someone today whether the school had ever entertained uh, solar panels on its roof. I don't know if you were aware of whether they I'm, I'm not aware of, of of any kind of add-ons, um, any plans to do an add-on. Um, I think a lot of that would obviously look at ROIs and things like that. Um, I, I don't. I wouldn't rule that out. I mean, certainly geothermal at Wentworth. Um, <coughs> the jury's still out on um, what kind of cost savings because I think we're still looking at electrical consumption to see where that lines up. We tend to get a lot more higher electrical costs but lower fuel costs. So um, I, I mean, I, I think that would be something that uh, certainly anything we could do jointly together as a municipality and a school district would be great. They've got a lot of roof surface area, and um, you know, as the layers under the uh, board of education, I think that probably would be, and being on the energy committee and thus mm -hmm. familiar with what we're doing, that would be worth at least broaching the subject. Yeah, I think Todd. Uh, one of the things that I'm I'm trying to to work with, and I know Tom's seen this too, is is Todd Jepsum has a has a good facility maintenance program and plan that he's got in place, and I think um, that might be a good kind of segue into that once we start looking at how they're managing facilities and things like that, if we could bring in some municipal structure to that as well, um, that might be a good opportunity to look at overall what's the best place for the town to do investments. Uh -huh. um, maybe it is, you know, the high school roof or something like that. So yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I would yeah, because it's a third-party yeah. investment, and then the town got the benefit of a reduced electrical yep. fee. Uh, with the option to purchase after the tax incentives, federal tax incentives for the private investor had uh, largely gone away after six, seven years. Uh, and so it, it, it's... I, I will say that, you know, um, not, I don't want to politicize anything, but uh, there is some question about where the, what credits are going to be coming forward in the future. Mm -hmm. I know right now the PUC, it's a kilowatt for kilowatt credit, in my understanding, Tom. That's true. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I don't know what the future is going to look like. Um, no one can really predict that, but certainly that plays into the uh, discussion on investment and, and where to best put the resources. And, and the sustainability coordinator, I'm sure, will have a big impact on that as well. I would hope they would. So, so hey, 
Yeah, just uh, three quick updates. Um, Coastal Harbor, as I've kind of reported in the past, has had sort of an ongoing conversation about the right balance of down in, in the Pine Point Co-op and some of our beaches, how do we have, how can we ensure that, you know, appropriate access for both those that are commercially fishing and recreational use. There's been some issues we, with parking. They have done kind of a site walk. They actually have decided to form sort of an ad hoc committee to get some input. They're going to be looking at that over the, the winter months and, and hopefully come back to the council sometime in the spring for some proposals. So that, that process is moving forward. They also had a conversation around as there is more and more demand to use sort of our, the, the facilities, the beaches, and the access for recreational type activities like kayak rentals and, and those types of things. They'd like to kind of be involved in kind of looking at that and making recommendations. So they're working on some of that. Um, the Shellfish Commission, there's been a real issue as I reported. Um, the, the, the clam flats and their production has been kind of variable over the last couple of years. They, they, the clam production's down. Actually tonight, in, 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 a, in a second I'll thank Tom, there's actually a presentation being done at the public library um, by the Down East Institute and they're, they're summarizing all the types of things that are sort of the natural predators on clams and other things. Tom has made arrangements to have that videotaped so that's available for, for some of those commission members that couldn't make it. Um, it'll be available for anybody on the committee that anybody in this group that's interested or anybody in the public. So we'll get some it's information run on public access too. So it'll, it'll run. And so for people that are interested in trying to understand that, that, that information will be out there. Um, and I guess that pretty much sums it up. The senior, senior advisory group met there. Um, as we know, Summerfest is this Friday. They're going to be down there. They're going to have, you know, a place for people to come and stop by and say hi. They're trying to do some surveys to try to gauge the interest of the community, the senior community, in different activities and things they'd like to see. So if anybody out there listening wants to stop by, they'd, they'd kind of love to hear from you about what, what they'd like to see sort of the senior group offer this community. So with that, I think that's the summary of the, of the groups. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Oh, yeah. Let's jump down to Council Baybox. Absolutely. Um, as I talk about others, if you can pass these down. Sure. Um, first uh, item I'll talk about, actually, I um, don't know whether this is good or bad, but um, I uh, can confirm that I was elected to the Maine Municipal Association's Legislative Policy Committee. So one more, um, one more commitment, but it's actually uh, very important because it is a group that uh, works directly with uh, advocating municipal, uh, um, what's the word, municipal challenges uh, with state government. <laughs> Our first meeting is actually on September 8th. Um, I've actually chosen to... Uh, focus a lot of my attention regarding appropriations and municipal revenue sharing and uh, more financial, financially driven uh, topics, including a couple of favorites in fisheries and wildlife. But uh, EcoMaine has not met this, uh, this summer yet. Um, it'll get started back up. Um, but um, looking forward to it. It's going to be a very tough market, so they have some financial challenges that obviously impact us as a community because um, uh, hopefully they can uh, take care of that without increasing tipping fees uh, or assessments. The library board also had a vacation this summer, but they have actually been working vacation from certain meetings. They are, they are actively working on their strategic plan. I believe they're finalizing that um, the week of August 23rd. Um, as soon as that is available, I'll uh, make sure that each of you do get a copy of that um, and it is shared once it is public. Um, and uh, the last item I wanted to mention was finance committee. Um, I just passed this around, but. Um, our finance director was able to provide us with a uh, balance sheet and income statement for the year ending. Again, I do want to clarify, because um, it is not documented on this, but these are unaudited and um, internal. Um, um, not that they're just internal numbers that haven't been checked by an auditor. So keep that in mind. So there are fluctuations between uh, um, her preparations and as well as the um, accounting that is done through an auditing process. Just some highlights to point out. We had a very, very successful year, at least preliminarily. Total assets are up approximately $2.1 million. Total liabilities are down $500,000. Uh, fund balance increased $2.6 million, keeping in mind that about $1 million of that was planned um, as part of the, um, uh, the bond issue, um, issuance for the last two years, so we knew that. So outside of that one plan, it's still a $1.6 million surplus is a very strong position to be in. Um, notice, uh, notable um, demarcations within the budget, for particularly on the revenue side, is that as we predicted, um, excise continues to increase given the 
Um, I think um, I like the term that Karen used earlier, the sound and um, if not robust economy um, is allowing us to realize um, pretty healthy increases over budget regarding excise, but also we're seeing that within our permits. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, ironically, the other one was revenue sharing was a significant adjustment over what was previously budgeted, which is a portion that we received from the state. Um, and then of course the due diligence and the uh, fiscal acumen by our managers um, or the manager and his managers um, expenses are below budget. There was one particular area that we're um, going to concentrate on to make sure that we're not um, over planning, I guess, in some ways, and that's within the community services, looking at pricing and making sure that uh, we're not pricing ourselves out because that typically has been a source of very strong um, excess revenues. So um, it's nice to be able to report we are in a very, very healthy position, and it looks like our financial work is working. Thank you. Councilor Rowan? I have none at this time. Thank you, Councilor Caterina. Uh, yes, um, I w did not make the Conservation Commission meeting because I was away on vacation, but uh, I read their notes from their meeting and they're working on, if you recall, we had a workshop with them um, regarding you know future impacts, potential impacts on sea level rise, um, and they are working on exactly um, a plan to bring forward to the Council as to how to meet with you know various department heads and whatever to get more you know information and a, a back and forth there. Uh, ordinance met yesterday. We will be forwarding to you, I believe, on the next meeting, which is what September 7th, I think. Mm -hmm. um, a new blasting ordinance. We never, we've never had one, um, and uh, there was some blasting that was associated with um, the new Martin's Point Health Center, which is pretty dense population area and some of the people over there were concerned um, about impacts and then in, they were concerned about why don't we have a blasting ordinance and the, uh, Chief Thurlow um, had been working on something for <laughs> a while but this just brought it to the forefront so expect to see something on that um, at our next council meeting and we also have a couple of uh, minor, I think they're minor changes to some potential traffic ordinance parking situation. So uh, that's it for me on Thank you. Uh, town manager's report. Yes, a couple quick things. Uh, I appreciate the bit of the reprieve over the summer months. Uh, we've had a great opportunity to uh, really move forward some projects. Um, I'm pleased to announce that the uh, gateway signs are finally in. This is kind of the second and final stage of our signage program. So this is at all the entrances to town. The major entrances have uh, a bit larger signs, and then there'll be smaller signs. There are smaller signs at the smaller entrances, like East Grand Avenue, right. Mold Orchard. Uh, we were successful in approaching service clubs in the Scarborough Community Chamber to help underwrite some of the costs. Um, as is customary with these welcome signs, uh, um, it's appropriate and customary to put the, the the social clubs that meet in town and those their their logos and such. So they were very quick to, uh, to support us in that regard, and, and I think they've been uh, that way historically as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Public Works, they did all the installation, which helped keep the cost down. I want to report on Partridge Lane. Uh, you may recall oh, yeah. many months back, uh, Partridge Lane, uh, we came forward with uh, a request. Unfortunately, Mr. Brown has been totally unresponsive um, at every single turn. And so we find ourselves now in the position, enough time has passed, and the authorization you've already granted me of actually uh, awarded a demolition bid to Risperia Brothers after an RFP process. Um, with you, the action you took those many months ago, we had the legal right to recover those costs. Um, so we'll be moving forward um, earlier this, probably in September at this point. Um, I've been invited to be, to sit on a panel at the MMA convention. This is a panel around municipal energy initiatives, and uh, our TriGen project was uh, identified as kind of a unique thing, which it is, and there'll be four other folks. I, I don't even know the, all the panelists at this point, but I'm pleased to represent the town and be, be part of that convention. I'm also pleased to announce uh, we're in the height of recruitments for new positions here in Town Hall. Uh, the assistant town manager position, we had 55 applicants from, frankly, all over the country and very pleased with the quality. And today was the first uh, day of interviews. I've chosen not to be involved myself in the first round. Uh, Mike Thurlow is, uh, is one of the folks on the interview panel, and they have uh, three or four more tomorrow, so 
uh, things are moving right on schedule in that regard. And the sustainability coordinator, we have 26 applicants so far. Quite pleased actually with mm, the, with the pool. Uh, and that position closes Sunday. So again, we're kind of on track to get positions uh, filled up um, for that October 1st start date. And lastly, we do expect to go to tax commitment uh, this week, Friday this week. Uh, in light of the recent law court decision regarding those 2012 appeals, at least a portion of them, uh, we will be putting in place for this commitment. Uh, we'll, we'll follow the, the law court's directive in that regard. Uh, ironically, it will actually add value to the town. Uh, I don't, I can't estimate it. It's not massive or significant, but it's certainly not going to be detrimental to the overall valuation of the town. And that's really because the law court decision uh, remanded just a portion that the town was largely victorious in all of the respects in terms of the court affirming our assessment practices, uh, but for one piece involving uh, kind of adjoining lots. And this is a, we followed a, a really a statewide practice that's been consistent for 30 years or better across the state and supported by main revenue so service, uh, I would add. So uh, this decision will have statewide impact, frankly. And it will have some negative impact for the 40 or so properties that have benefited from this program of having an adjoining lot being valued a little less. And we uh, just talked briefly today, but we expect to do some direct outreach to those folks so they understand why their value is changing. And we'll probably be doing some, um, some meetings with them as well. Um, I think Any that's it. About that or is that Yes. So, so there's no grace period. There's, it, that has to be implemented immediately, as far as we understand the reading from the court. I, uh, fortuitously, I suppose, uh, since we're not at commitment, we have time to make that change now, and and we think it's best to follow the directive from the law court uh, mm -hmm. as as soon as we possibly can. So we will be. Uh, you know, the other the other matters. The remand <coughs> is back to the board of assessment review. Um, they're looking to meet as soon as entirely possible. We have some challenges. It's still summer to some. Um, but I expect they'll be meeting within the month to deal with that issue. And at this point, where we've been doing some financial modeling, we don't expect there'll be many, uh, there'll, there'll be little, if any, financial impact um, given the court ruling. Mm -hmm. Chris. So just to follow up for that, Tom, if I could, please. Um, so we're going to go ahead and decouple um, outright and then whatever comes out of the review board will assess afterwards or? Well, this is on, this is on a going forward basis. Uh, it's not really decoupling. These, uh, we had adopted a standard practice of uh, adjoining lots in common ownership. Um, those adjoining lots were valued at, at a, a lesser number, if you will. They'll simply be valued at market rate. And so we'll make that change going forward. The Board of Assessment Review will deal with how to deal with past tax years. Okay. Um, I have to be one of these people who had one of those joining lots. <laughs> um, I know two years ago I was asked whether I wanted it to be contiguous or not, and I said absolutely not because it's a developable lot. So mm -hmm. you're, like, uh, so you're I, not likely to be affected. No, I know that, and I, and I understand that. But people back at that point had an opportunity whether they – so there should be some knowledge. Now I understand uh -huh. some people will have forgotten that they were asked yeah, about sure. that. But so my question to you is: Is 30 or 40? Is that who was left over after, or, or is that 30 or 40 are those that that uh, chose that not cho that chose not to that, that that wanted us to continue for valuation pur for yeah. assessment purposes to c consider them continuous, continuous. Yeah. Consolid as yeah. if they were right. consolidated. Yeah. Right. Okay, I was just, uh, and, I was just and gain the tax benefit from that right. assumption. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions? No. Good. Councilor comments. Uh, oh, start down. Oh, wait. Sure. Sorry. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> Mr. Hall, yes. Did you update us on fireworks? Uh, what? Just we've been Can, doing that uh, survey and. I will. I will. Or are you going to address that I later? Will. Okay. I will. I, I will. Okay. Good. Sure. I'm all set tonight. Thank Good, you. thank you. I also have nothing. I'm sorry, but I do have something. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to remind everybody, I, I happened to, when I was out uh, knocking on doors the, uh, for the last month, um, I've been running into uh, people, particularly elderly people, who have uh, 
wells that are not drilled wells. They're what we call dug wells, and they're worried about the drought, and actually some of them had been having to go to the store and buy water, so to speak. So I talked to uh, Mr. Hall about um, if we could put something out to remind people that Scarborough uh, does have a water source. It's free. It's available to the public. So, you know, you don't have to go into the facility. You don't have to ask permission. It's at the Dunstan Fire Station, which is at 639 U.S. Route 1. Um, and there's, when you're looking directly at the fire station, it's, I'm terrible with directions, so on the left-hand side of the building, there's a big sign there, the, a blue sign that says, public drinking water, and just feel free to stop in. You do have to bring your own container, though. Um, but it is a source of water for people because this drought uh, is affecting some of the uh, less deep wells in the mm. area. So, Thank you. Yep. Councilor Chiesa. Um, uh, just a couple quick comments. First of all, um, uh, Summerfest is this Friday. I uh, hope to see everybody there. It's a great opportunity for us to come together as a community and enjoy this wonderful weather we've had. Hopefully, knock on wood, we'll, we'll get it for Friday. Um, so looking forward to that. It's always a nice uh, a nice kind of cap off to the summer as we get ready to send the kids back to school. It's always a nice time. Um, I also did want to just clarify my position earlier on Councillor Babine's motion. I don't want people to misinterpret that, to think that there's any malintent or I believe there's any malintent or anything. I, I simply just didn't agree with the wording of it. I think the intent is there. I would agree with that 100%. I don't think there's any uh, anything going on behind the scenes or anything like that. Or I, I don't want it to be misinterpreted. So I just simply didn't like the wording of it, and I, I thought uh, maybe we'd get a little bit more um, input, maybe, let's say, from <coughs> either legal or, or another group. So. So I don't want that to be mis misconstrued. So I, I do support the, the principle of it. Uh, it was just a more of a technical thing. I, yeah, I interpreted your comments to be some dissatisfaction with the wording. And hopefully you'll have the opportunity to look at the wording, maybe bounce it off some others. Yep. Uh, we have a second reading yep. and the opportunity to make amendments and work to perhaps work with Councilor Babine on, on those concerns. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Just hope everybody enjoys the rest of the summer. It's going fast. <laughs> yeah. uh, I did want to extend a thank you to the Cornerstone Baptist Church. They extended uh, an invitation uh, to me and to my wife over the 4th of July holidays. They had a uh, luncheon thank you party for uh, public officials. Uh, and it was a, a very nice event on Memorial Field, uh, and, uh, and they were very gracious, and I appreciated the opportunity to represent the town council uh, and told them a little bit about the kind of cooperative attitude that we've been uh, successful in implementing in this past year. So uh, thank you for the, uh, Jeffrey Bateman, the pastor, and the Cornerstone Baptist Church. The uh, fireworks survey has uh, had over a thousand responses at this point, really extraordinary uh, degree of interest. Uh, I thought that the best way for us to pursue it is to schedule in the future a workshop where we have something of a listening session uh, and, and let people who might be on both sides of the question come in and discuss it. Uh, and give us the opportunity then to exchange our own feedback that we've been getting from uh, uh, constituents in, in the town. So that's how I think we'll take the next step, uh, see if we can get a, a bit of a consensus on what direction this thing should go, at which point it would go to ordinance. Uh, the uh, shorefront uh, owner tax abatement suit was addressed by the town manager. Uh, the decision is a very well-reasoned decision as to why the town was absolutely correct and appropriate in the uh, reasoning that it used to conduct a partial revaluation of the shorefront properties. It was, to say the least, very thorough. Uh, and that was, I think, as the public is aware, the gist of that lawsuit was that. The other issue that uh, has received some attention in the newspaper 
article that was today was one that actually doesn't have any effect on the shorefront property owner's property. It was this ancillary lot, side lot, that is undeveloped, that is contiguous to a developed lot and had been treated under state authorization uh, as entitled to be treated as if it were uh, consolidated, even though it was not. The Supreme Court found that to not be an appropriate practice, uh, and so there will be uh, numerous towns in the state that will uh, change that practice. The consequence of it is to add a, a, a assessed value to the town so that it doesn't have an adverse financial consequence uh, uh, in any fashion. So I did want to just uh, uh, comment further on that. As far as the organics issues, uh, they've been in the news lately. The uh, town of South Portland is grappling with this whole issue of how do you enforce an organics policy that you apply town-wide. And I've always had a problem with that. Uh, it's, it is the bugaboo of anyone who thinks, yes, uh, trying to get less pesticides used is a good idea, but how do you go about it? It's a state problem, and many people feel it should be addressed at the state level. Uh, what I thought, we have a policy that applies to the public space, our ball fields and lawns. Uh, our program is presently in the capable hands of our pest management committee. Mm -hmm. They are following the South Portland and Portland initiatives to see what's going on. Uh, by next year, we should have a pretty good handle from a 2012 start time for our policy. That's when we began in May of 2012. Uh, so that we'll have a good handle on a cost-benefit analysis, the cost implications of this and the benefits that we've seen. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that I think the Finance Committee will be probably looking at and uh, giving us some guidance and the Pest Management Committee will be looking at to uh, uh, assess it. And it probably, it probably won't be my call, but at some point in the next six or nine months, a workshop to have some thorough discussion and, uh, and make sure that we all have the same data uh, and, uh, and have a good airing of the issue. Anything further for the cause of the town? None? So regarding the fireworks, I think the only thing I'd like to point out is that there's, you know, the next time that we have permitted fireworks is in December, so there's really no rush for us to, right. to act on that. Exactly. Right. And I think we'll keep the uh, polling going for a little bit longer and then just as a practical matter close it up. Vote early and often is the thing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 time is legal. <laughs> yeah. uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Thank you. We are adjourned. That's what you were calling.